go ahead and kick us off and get started. So our first of our two presentations today is from John Burke, who's an ecologist with the Fairfax County Park Authority. And I believe you're in my building, so we're neighbors. I haven't actually seen you yet. That's right. uh, but he's going to be presenting on wildlife, and this is his first presentation with us. We're really excited to see this presentation and to learn a little bit more about wildlife. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off, and I'll let you know if we get any questions. Okay, great. Um, so I have a question. I already have a question. Um, are folks allowed to like speak out in the middle of my presentation with questions, or if I ask a question to the group, can anyone talk and respond to me? Is that possible? That's a really great question. I think when we've gotten started, everyone comes in as muted, but everyone shouldn't be able to unmute themselves. That does mean that everybody needs to be, you know, a little bit careful with their mic. So you can go ahead and turn that on and off as you needed, but everyone should be able to unmute themselves to answer your question, or if they're not comfortable doing so, they can also comment in the chat and I can let you know what they say. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. All right, so, um, Hey everybody, this is my first year with Envirothon. Uh, my name is John Burke. I'm the branch manager for um, Natural Resources Branch for Fairfax County Park Authority. Um, and just a quick note, my background is uh, primarily actually in aquatic ecology, but I've also done a lot with um, ecotoxicology uh, of amphibians and reptiles and things like that. Um, so I'm happy to be talking with you all today. And we've got a lot to cover, um, and I haven't had too much coffee, so I'm not going to try and you know blow through it really quickly. But um, I'm going to try and keep things moving. But if you have any questions, you know, feel free to you can either put them in the text or or shout them out. Either are fine. Um, so we're going to be covering wildlife today. Um, these are the basics of the basics. Uh, this is basically uh, a whole uh, intro class to wildlife condensed into one presentation. So you're going to want to do some more digging on it, some of these individual topics. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on on any one, we're just, just gonna kind of give you a scatter shot of what you need to know. So to go over what we're gonna be covering, basically we're gonna do a quick cover cover of uh, you know, mammals, birds, and herps, and herps is herpetofauna, which is amphibians and reptiles. We'll briefly discuss ecology, touch on conservation and management of wildlife, and maybe even some examples of here, some here in Fairfax County that my branch does. And then uh, ongoing issues involving wildlife and society. I'm sure you've experienced some of those yourselves here living in Fairfax. There's, there's plenty to talk about. All right, so let's uh, start it off with our knowledge of birds, mammals, and herpetofauna or herps. And you know, whenever we're talking about wildlife or or organisms in general, um, we need to talk about uh, Carl Linnaeus's uh, ranking system. It's basically a system of nomenclature where uh, in 1735 he gave us this system of organizing. Uh, organisms into uh, different taxonomic groups, if you will. Um, so basically kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And this goes from very broad to very specific. Uh, and um, basically, um, you know, whenever we're talking about an organism, it can be categorized into this system. Uh, typically, we're talking genus and species when you hear like the Latin name thrown around. But if you break it down long enough, you know, it'll fall into all these categories. So um, easy way to remember that is some mnemonic devices. Do qualis prefer wood or fruit, generally speaking? Good question. I would guess fruit. So if we're using this classification system, um, we have an example of uh, a bob white. Um, this is uh, a type of bird we have here. So we would recognize that um, as far as its genus and species, it's a common bird uh, in the uh, New World grouse. Uh, family and, you know, its genus and species would be specific to, um, you know, this organism. In the genus, there might be a couple other um, species within the genera that represent uh, New World uh, grouses, but um, this is the one we have here in Virginia. <clears throat> so when we're identifying uh, organisms, um, you know, we're talking about mammals, birds, and herpetofauna, uh, there's common generalizations you can make about the way that uh, ecologists or wildlife biologists do this, or even, you know, citizen scientists when they're looking at these things. Um, and you can, the nice thing about this is here in Fairfax, we have, you know, such great diversity, you can practice these techniques out in the field and you know, throughout the country as well. So for mammals, um, they're, they can be a little bit tougher because, uh, you know, they're, sometimes they're, they may be nocturnal, harder to find, you certainly uh, may have a hard time getting a hold of them. Um, and some of them are very cryptic or don't like to be seen. So unfortunately, a lot of times, when we're IDing mammals, we're looking at what they left behind. So sometimes that could be 
something that was you know, like a melted specimen, something that was harvested, but oftentimes it's like uh, scat, which is poop, tracks, uh, or the remains of those critters. You know, that's a good way to tell what that animal was if you can't give it visual identification on it. Usually when you can see the animal uh, alive, you know, you can make some uh, pretty quick uh, assumptions about, you know, its color, its overall size, and the form of its body where you can quickly identify it. But in many cases, we're left to ID using what the animal has left behind, so to speak. Um, birds are really cool. And if you think about IDing birds, and you, you talk to birders a lot of times, uh, you know, you'll hear them talk about the different bird songs and mnemonic devices for remembering the different calls that birds make. But um, if you've ever, like, listened to birds out in the woods, you know, especially with, like, things like the mockingbirds or blue jays, often their calls are not distinct, um, and they can even mimic other birds. So can, that can throw you off. So it's only one way um, that we ID birds. We also rely on things um, like silhouettes, you know, color, size, uh, some of the other things that we look at in mammals. And then uh, herpetofauna, uh, amphibians and reptiles, a lot of times we can ID those in hand. They're, they're not hard to come across if you know where to look. In many cases, they're not particularly quick, although some can be very cryptic. Um, so in this area, uh, frogs are a good example of something that we would use sound to identify. So if you've ever been out to, say, Huntley Meadows or Dyke Marsh, you know, you can hear those frogs in the evenings or in the mornings. And a lot of times you can identify the frog by the call. Uh, typically, they're more distinct than birds, although there is some suggestion that different, uh, you know, regional populations of frogs will have slightly different accents to their calls. Uh, same thing with birds, actually. It's pretty fascinating. But then you can look at things like body, body shape uh, and skin texture as well to figure out what exactly you're looking at. So I think silhouettes are probably one of the more reliable ways of IDing birds, especially if you're far away, which often is the case with birds. And you can have a really nice pair of binoculars, but they can still be pretty tough and oftentimes you're not going to see a whole lot of diversity within one species as far as its silhouette is made up. So I've got a couple examples here and you can see we've got basic families of birds here and their silhouettes up top. I'm going to throw some pictures up here and you can tell fairly quickly, you know, which of these groups this bird belongs to. So we'll throw this one out here and if anyone wants to chime in what they think this is in the chat. I can't see the chat, but someone could just read it out to me. That'd be awesome. Guesses. So we're looking at the overall length of the bird. We're looking at how stout it is. Obviously, the shape of his beak, which is adapted to eating certain organisms. We had a guess. Is it a warbler or a nuthatch? Okay, let's see. Let's take a look at our warbler here. Uh, where is our warbler? Um, okay, so very good. It, a warbler or a nuthatch, and it does have very um, similar characteristics uh, to both. They do have very similar life histories as well, oftentimes relying on like, small insects. That's why you see this little beak there. Um, it, it is actually a nuthatch. Um, so very similar, um, obviously with certain species, you know, their silhouettes are a little bit harder to separate or families rather a little bit harder to, to, to distinguish. Um, but yeah, you got it. I think we're all familiar with these. Um, Woodpeckers, uh, and the representation we have here is fairly distinct of a pileated woodpecker. You know, it's like the sort of woody woodpecker, really large, loud woodpecker that you see around here. But we also have representatives uh, in this area, the hairy and downy woodpeckers, which are much smaller. But if you look at their silhouette, it's kind of similar. Although this guy has got a bit of a, a crest here on his head. And then another common bird you'll see herons are also fairly distinct and representative of what you might see. Uh, for birds that uh, are either shorebirds or, or things that are going to be adapted to standing in water and capturing snakes, frogs, and fish, um, long legs, a sharp, long beak, and a long neck. When we're talking about mammals in their ID, um, I had mentioned, you know, the things they leave behind. And especially during this time of year when there's snow on the ground or there's mud on the ground, you can look at the tracks and make a lot of assumptions about what kind of animal you're looking at. So um, assumptions about the size of the animal can be ascertained from the tracks as well as uh, distinguishing characteristics from the actual shape of the track itself. So, you know, just as a, an example, you know, um, uh, you know, cats, in, all, in many cases around here, if we see feline tracks, it's from a, a domesticated house cat, you know, they have retractable claws, so you won't even often see those in the tracks. But if you have a, a dog species, fox, or, um, you know, coyote, something like that, you know, you'll, you'll be able to see the claws actually imprinted because they're unable to retract their claws. Just something to think about. Um, and there's a lot to go into when it comes to tracks as well. Um, but uh, you, know, you can make a lot of assumptions based on the size, shape, and also the gait of the animal that you're looking at. So skulls, I'm talking about mammals again. 
um, they really do tell us a lot about the life history of an animal. That is um, how that animal survives, what it does in its day to day life as far as eating, um, its habitat, things like that. So you can look at things like teeth, eye sockets, nasal passages, auditory bones. Uh, if it has horns or antlers, um, you know, they tell us uh, when it's most active, you know, how it sees and smells, whether it's a predator or prey. Uh, sometimes we can tell it's, it's age and sex if you're really good at it. Um, but uh, as an example, you know, if we were looking at something that you know, relied on, uh, you know, uh, eyesight as a means of hunting, you know, the size of its orbits, that's the, the eye sockets in relation to the overall size of the skull, you know, is generally uh, proportional to the sharpness of how well it can see, how much it relies on, on its eyesight. So things like that uh, you know, really tell you a lot about what type of animal you're looking at. And of course, a big one, um, what type of teeth does it have tells you about what it's, uh, what, it, what it's adapted to survive on, what its diet is. So you know, humans have incisors, canines, and molars, while other animals may have uh, some or none of those, and we can make assumptions about its diet based on uh, what, uh, what, what its teeth look like. So uh, speaking of eating things, um, this is what happens afterwards, and scat, or poop, is a great way of figuring out uh, what type of mammal has been in the area. So, um, again, you can go into a lot of detail and become a, an expert about what you're, you know, tracking or what you're looking at as far as what kind of droppings it leaves behind. Um, but it can tell us about a, an animal's movement. You know, it can tell us uh, what animals are present in a given area. Uh, some animal poop is like full of seeds, which shows the animal eats fruit or berries. Um, and sometimes you can see seasonal trends in an animal's diet. Like if you're in Alaska, and you're looking at bear poop, you can see you know what transition from transitions from like a salmon heavy diet to maybe like a seed heavy diet or generally what the animal has been feeding on recently. It can contain things like bones and fur. Um, and one other thing that's interesting is that, you know, um, scat can also contain you know, DNA. Uh, so you can actually extract DNA from scat uh, and it's a non-invasive way. It means like you're, you're not injuring the animal or taking a piece of skin or hair from the animal. You're not uh, stressing the animal essentially. Um, and you can learn about that, uh, that animal from the DNA. You can, you can tell like the genetic health of the species. Um, if, if a certain individual animal is occupying a given territory, you know, you can break it down into the individuals as well. So really cool stuff. Okay. Uh, so we talked a little bit about mammals. Um, when it comes to herpetofauna, uh, amphibians and reptiles, like I said, you, know, you can go into a lot of detail about, um, the general shape, um, skin texture of the animal, um, size, and then if it has a vocalization, you know, the call. But one thing that's a common question that comes up around here, so this is what we're going to focus on. Uh, I get a lot of calls about snakes, as you might imagine, and how to tell whether they're venomous or non-venomous. So this rule applies in Virginia. It may not apply uh, worldwide, um, but there is some common traits among venomous and non-venomous snakes that, that you can assume in this state. So um, there are three venomous snakes in Virginia. Does anyone know what they are? You can type them in the chat while I'm, while I'm gabbing about the, uh, how, to, how to tell them apart. But there's three species. See if you can tell me what they are. As far as telling, telling them apart, um, you can look at the pupil of, of the snake. Um, so non-venomous snakes in Virginia will have a round pupil. Well, the venomous snakes will have like a, a elliptical or cat-like pupil. You can see here with this um, venomous snake uh, that I've given away one of the answers. <laughs> uh, and uh, some other assumptions, you know, the, the shape of the head. So um, the, the venomous snakes in this area have been described as having an arrowhead shaped head versus a rounder head for non venomous snakes. And then also, if you look at the cloaca or the vent um, uh, at the bottom of the snake here, you can see these are the scutes or scales of the snake, um, subcaudal plates, some people call them. And after the vent or cloaca of the snake, uh, if you've got double rows of scutes or scales, then it's a non venomous snake. You've got single rows, like you see here with this cotton mouth, you've got a venomous snake. This is really great if you find a shed. Because these uh, characteristics come through in the shed as well, sometimes the head too. All right, so uh, anyone know what the three species are? Did I get any good guesses in the chat? We didn't get any guesses in the chat yet. Someone might enter them still, or anyone can feel free to unmute themselves and answer that question. And I guess that you're talking about if you've got, you know, a picture of a snake, then you can use the information about um, their tail, but probably you wouldn't want to see that close in person just in case. 
yeah, um, definitely don't want to be handling uh, wild snakes if you don't have. All right, I saw a chat pop up. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and give the answer. I think you got them all. So cottonmouth, copperhead, and timber rattlesnake or cane break rattlesnake. King snake's a good guess. They eat other snakes typically, but they are not venomous. So that's what we have here. Uh, and in this area, Fairfax County and all of Virginia, you'll find copperheads. And I've seen them here. I've seen them in Arlington County too. They're definitely here. I even know people that have been bitten by them. Timber rattlesnakes are, are really special. They're up in the mountains. You don't really see them too much. Um, cotton mouths, I've seen them typically like Richmond and South, uh, in the Eastern part of the state. We'll find those. So we got a couple here. These aren't the best pictures for IDing uh, venomous versus non-venomous, but I expect many of you have probably seen some of these snakes before. So up here we, oops, heard there. So up here we have our um, corn snake. And a lot of folks have these as pets. You can see it's got round pupils and a broadly round shaped head. And then this is our copperhead. In fact, there's two of them down here. And like I said, copperheads are really common around here. So I'll give you a quick uh, way to ID those. You can't always rely on co color with her pedofauna for ID but or pattern, but typically with uh, copperheads, you'll see this bow tie pattern, dark over light species. So cool stuff. So close it out. We'll talk once more about our classification because this is really important. Remember we break uh, uh, our um, animals down or, or organisms down into kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Don't forget those. And again, this is our uh, our bob white. So this is one of our New World quail species, Pinus virginianus. <clears throat> Why Latin? Because that's how it started, and everyone uses it. Okay, let's talk about wildlife ecology. So we got a lot to cover here. Um, we're going to cook through this pretty fast, but there's a lot of important uh, takeaways here. Um, and these um, general topics sort of guide the broader science when it comes to uh, wildlife ecology. Um, they they uh, drive, you know, how we study, understand, uh, and in some cases modify populations within a given habitat, and that includes Fairfax County. Um, so some of the stuff you'll probably already know, but we're going to go through it anyways. Um, and habitat has multiple components that are part of it. Um, as you might expect, you know, this is the area where the organisms live that's got the food, water, shelter, and space they need to survive. Um, and this differs wildly from animal to animal, although some could be very similar. So if you look at our two fox species here, you can see um, red foxes are probably more uh, adapted to living in urban areas uh, because they can get what they need from those areas in the form of rodents, while gray foxes typically rely on trees and things like that. They're more specialists, so they have to have upland woods, riparian, which, is mean, which means next to streams, habitats, and swamps, and pine forests. So two fox species in Virginia, two separate types of habitats. Uh, and you know, a portion of habitat um, is the cover and shelter available. Um, and just like the reasons that we would use cover and shelter protection uh, from the elements and protection from predators, you know, that's probably more applicable to our animals. But basically, it's a safe place for them. Uh, like you can see with this cottontail rabbit here to keep warm and keep safe. Another element of habitat is water, and really crucial to this is you know, how do they get water, how much do they need. So um, typically, you know, animals obtain water through free water, which is water <laughs> in puddles, you know, from rain, lakes, you know, for us, free water would be like you know, naturally occurring uh, vegetation. Uh, diet also provides a lot of animals water, especially herbivores. Um, and then one thing that we don't talk a lot about, which is metabolic water, which is really fascinating. So metabolic water is basically, you know, the water that's produced when an animal metabolizes um, like proteins and fats in its body. So um, basically water that the animal is not ingesting that's already stored and it is released through, um, through uh, the, the uh, breaking down the oxidization of those energy containing substances in their bodies. And um, you know, that's how a lot of migratory birds can get the water they need. Um, you know, for the, for long trips, and you know, or, or animals that live in deserts, for example, a lot of times they rely on metabolic water, and humans also receive metabolic water, but it's like a, a net balance with humans. So we basically like release as much water as we gain from um, from metabolic water, so we don't get a net benefit from it. But things like birds actually do, you know, get a, a net benefit from this uh, this source of water, which is really cool. Within a habitat, you might find microhabitats, or you will find microhabitats. Different organisms are adapted to these, but these are, you know, basically, as the name implies, very small areas that have a unique setting that is perfect for that organism to survive in. And you know, here in Fairfax County, um, we're looking in the woods. Microhabitats 
could be things like decomposing logs. Um, within a, the larger habitat of an oak hickory forest, you'd have a decomposing log, which represents the right moisture um, and food content for things like millipedes to survive. Um, also, things like living trees represent uh, microhabitats for organisms, particularly if you think of a, one that's uh, been talked about recently, the emerald ash borer, which is decimating our ash trees around here. You know, it relies on the microhabitat of the bark, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, flow in the inner tissue of a living um, tree. Also, things like leaf litter that would be considered a microhabitat, just the spaces within a larger habitat that these organisms uh, need to survive. So, um, habitats uh, fall within a range of an organism. And, you know, as you know, a range is basically where that animal lives. And sometimes that can be like where that animal is found currently. Sometimes it can be um, where it could potentially be found. These are all described in different ways, but essentially it's the area that, that fulfills the need of that organism as far as available food, cover, water, um, and reproductive requirements, depending on you know, how that organism reproduces and what kind of um, system it needs to raise its young in, or, or at least you know, a place where it can, it can breed successfully. So um, you know, this is, is interesting to think about because uh, you know, home ranges of, of predators are really important. Um, because if you if you look at urban environments, for example, um, typically those those ranges like start to shrink, you know, as, as animals get closer and closer to urbanization. You know, they have to either shrink their environment by adaptation or through uh, loss of habitat. You know, they either live with a, live in a smaller habitat or move on and expand their habitat elsewhere. And if you look at things like wolves, cougars, and other large mammals. Um, it really helps in the study of those organisms because in uh, unmodified habitats, you can make a lot of assumptions about the general population if we, you understand the required home range or uh, habitat size for those organisms. Um, <clears throat> so, in addition to that, uh, with your, your overall range, you also have to keep in mind some of the smaller uh, or the sub aspects of what that range entails, including uh, wintering, migration, and breeding habitats. Um, and something also to know when you're talking about like migration, you know, we often typically think about, um, you know, birds, uh, you know, flying across the country, but there's also like vertical migration. So birds, uh, depending on like the time of day can also, um, mig migrate, uh, by their altitude, so to speak. So it's called altitudinal migration or, or vertical migration. Um, and basically like sometimes when birds reach like the mountain region uh, during the summer. And they might go down to the plains region in the winter, and that's based on like, you know, food availability or trying to survive in a given temperature. Um, there's also some uh, similar aquatic organisms that do this as well within like the depth of a lake. So you might have an organism that migrates towards uh, towards the surface at night and then down low uh, in the evening. So kind of cool stuff. So limiting factors are basically those things within the animal's habitat that prevents, you know, the population of organisms from growing in a large kind of keeps things shrunk down, so to speak, so they can't just grow out of control wildly. Um, and then typically broke down to abiotic or biotic factors. So abiotic basically means like non-living things or things not associated with living organisms. And then biotic factors are things that might limit um, the success of a population, um, predation from other organisms or competition for food or availability of food in the form of place, um, sorry, plants for herbivores or available prey items uh, for carnivores. <clears throat> so, um, I think I'm gonna skip here. Okay, so when we're talking about, you know, you've heard me use the term population, uh, community, ecosystem, you know, these are all uh, terms that you'll need to know, and they are broad ways of describing, let's see, are these limiting factors produced by humans, whether it's on purpose or not? Uh, definitely, yes. So some of these, um, some of these limiting factors can be uh, anthropogenic, um, things like available habitat, for example. Um, if we're competing with those organisms for food, for example, that would also be uh, a limiting factor. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in case in places like Fairfax County, um, that is often the case. Great question. <clears throat> All right, so broadly speaking, when we're describing organisms, uh, you know, we break them down into ecosystem, population, or community. And I think pictures do a better job of describing this. So I'm gonna to skip to the next slide here. And um, population is basically a group of one organism. 
community is like the organisms within a given area, you know, that survive, interact together, that sort of thing. And then the ecosystem is all the biotic and abiotic factors, you know, within that given area. That's generally how we break it down. So one type of organism, all organisms, and then organisms and non-organisms in that area. <clears throat> so uh, niche is a is an interesting concept. Uh, it's sort of like a microhabitat. Um, that can it, it can not it can be non-spatial. So um, it's the specialized area or uh, food source, um, you know, that, a, that an organism use. You know, here it's described as a, an actual physical area, but I think a lot of times organisms fill niches that might be um, related to other elements as well, like like diet and things like that. Um, but if we're talking about physical niches, um, which is certainly something you can see all around the world, uh, it's basically, you know, how a given organism utilizes its physical space versus another. So the example given here uh, per, of birds in a pine tree is a great example, because if you think about a given niche, some organisms like woodpeckers might uh, primarily occupy, you know, or, or hang out or utilize, you know, the trunk of a pine tree, you know, to extract insects well. Other organisms might use the tree for nesting and primarily be on the outskirts of the tree, while other organisms like, say, a bald eagle may have a nest, but it would be like at the top of the tree. So where those birds function, where they occupy in a given physical space, you know, where they survive the best and where they've adapted to survive the best is usually referred to as a niche. Although more broadly speaking, you can also make some assumptions about, um, you know, specialization as far as like uh, diet and things like that. And speaking of specialists, um, organisms can also be broken down uh, into generalists or specialists, and that is basically saying like how flexible they are as far as food habitat that are concerned. So, um, good examples, you know, uh, we use the examples of black bears here for being generalists, and that's certainly true. They can eat fish, they can eat meat, berries, grasses, insects, honey, you know, garbage, and that is absolutely true. They can survive and have adapted to a number of different habitats and food sources. Um, but then the alternative would be specialists, and as the name implies, they have a few, you know, specific things that they can survive on uh, to really succeed. And if they don't have those things, that they're uh, at risk of going extinct. And a lot of times when you see organisms that go extinct, it's because they were specialists. Um, so, you know, a bear and a red cockaded woodpecker, um, you know, those are two very different organisms to describe a generalist and specialist. But if you want to get specific and focus on birds, for example, um, you know, so you have your red cockaded woodpecker, which is a longleaf pine specialist. You know, it has to have that tree in order to survive. But um, a local example of a good generalist that you probably have seen a lot of is like a cardinal. Um, and you see a lot of cardinals around here. You hear a lot of cardinals, and cardinals are generalists. They've adapted to survive um, in a number of different habitats and, and utilize a number of different food sources. And that's one reason they've been success so successful in the uh, urban environment. Um, so within the population, um, you know, scientists study how a uh, given population uh, ebbs and flows, you know, how that structure changes over time based on the age structure. Um, and then we typically refer to this as like population dynamics and it helps us understand, you know, and project the growth or decline of a given organ <clears throat> population or how that popul population may move to utilize a certain habitat um, or impacts uh, as stated before, you know, you know, anthropogenic impacts to that population, you know, you can, quantitatively assess these things. Um, involves a lot of different ways of studying them, but it's basically broken down into to these factors you see here. And when scientists are looking at a population, these are often the things that they're looking at to, to make assumptions about how that population is moving. So, you know, age structure, sex ratio, mating systems, you know, how many things are living or dying um, and being born. And, and the combination of those elements can tell you a lot about how that population is being impacted by, uh, you know, something else like a disease, for example, if you see uh, high rates of mortality and it's affecting the age structure, it may be more uh, impactful on the young or maybe more impactful on one, uh, you know, one subpopulation uh, of, of the organisms that you're looking at. So um, these are generally the elements that we're looking at when we're trying to make those uh, assumptions. <clears throat> So um, when we're talking about limiting factors too, uh, I also like to discuss carrying capacity. And um, this is often denoted as K in, in wildlife science. And basically um, the K factor or K is you know, the maximum number of individuals uh, that can be sustained within a given environment over a certain period of time. So like how many of a 
how many organisms can live here before like, they just consume all the resources and things level out and it either declines, um, you know, or they're just not able to grow any further. So here you can see a great example. Um, carrying capacity of deer is often tested, but uh, it's tested in a way that's not strictly uh, biological or, uh, or, or naturally occurring, so to speak. So, um, you know, cultural cap carrying capacity, you know, is the maximum number of individuals of the species that humans will tolerate. So, um, deer might not be a good example because we have different levels of tolerance for deer, but, you know, things like ticks or mosquitoes may have a lower cultural carrying capacity, uh, you know, than organisms that we don't. And oftentimes, this says may or may not be the same as a species biological carrying capacity. Oftentimes, it's not. So uh, we, as humans, take steps to control those organisms, organisms which we view are you know, exceeding the cultural carrying capacity, right? And that can uh, be reflected or studied um, you know, by human wildlife conflicts, for example. So a good example for deer would be like, you know, how many car crashes per year are we willing to tolerate before we take steps to make sure that the population you know, it, it is under control from a cultural caring perspective because the deer in Fairfax County have no problem getting uh, the resources they need, at least they do now. <clears throat> so you can see the caring capacity at work here. Um, oftentimes it's tied to some of the limiting factors we discussed before. Um, this is a great example, um, the lynx and snowshoe hare. It's like a common classic example of relationships between predator prey dynamics, the prey being, you know, the limiting factor for the population of lynx. And you can see here, with this graph, it, there's like a direct relationship. Now, sometimes what you'll see with these population graphs is you'll see the spike of the prey population followed by a spike in the predator population and then a, substance, or a, a sequential decline in both as the uh, populations of both ebb and flow over time. This is a very clean cut example uh, of the relationship between these two organisms. Um, you know, snowshoe hare is the primary food of the lynx, population cycles uh, of these species, uh, you know, are closely linked, and then when the hares are plentiful, the lynx eat pretty much just the hares, uh, and then you know they prey upon other things, mice, voles, squirrels. You know when the hares are scarce, but uh, in reality, other relationships between organisms can be much more complex. But this is a just a, a good example of, of demonstrating you know, basic predator prey dynamics, kind of along the same lines here. Um, you know, food chains are kind of an old school way of of presenting or thinking about. Uh, how a uh, community interacts as far as, you know, which animal consumes another uh, or plants, you know, but, uh, food webs are, are, are a better way of demonstrating that because oftentimes these relationships are complex. You know, it's not just one uh, and then the other and then the other. So, you know, if you look at a food web, this is more, and this is even a simplica simplification, but this is more realistic of reality of, you know, in a, in a given uh, community, how all the different organisms uh, would interact. So typically, um, much more descriptive and frankly more useful um, from a manager's perspective. One thing this doesn't show is uh, decomposers and you can teach a whole class just on decomposers and the role they play uh, in ecosystems. We're not gonna go too much into those, but um, you know, they you know, play a huge part in the system as well. You know, decomposing insects, uh, fungus, all kinds of stuff like that. It's, it's really fascinating stuff, but we're not gonna get too much into that. So you'll hear this term thrown around a lot, biodiversity. Um, many times it's the goal for a given management activity uh, or restoration. So a lot of the stuff we do here in Fairfax County aims towards achieving uh, biodiversity in our restorations. Um, and oftentimes when we're talking about biodiversity, we're really talking about, you know, getting a lot of species. Um, but um, generally it also includes things like genetics. Uh, and um, really the diversity of genes that is generally more individuals with more uh, genetic variety is better for the species overall. You know, that's what we're also looking for as well, although that can't always be uh, assessed accurately just because of the scale of that, what that work would entail, though some folks do try to do that. Um, and then also, you know, if you're looking at a, in a broader scope like Fairfax County, we wanna make sure we have uh, a diversity of ecosystems as well, making sure that all the different organisms that, you know, native to this area are able to survive with what they need. So uh, a broader scale, that's what we're factoring in as well. So, you know, with ecosystems, you know, they are not, uh, at least, you know, well, no ecosystems are static and certainly not a terrestrial forest ecosystems here uh, in the eastern part of the United States, Fairfax County and throughout the world. But this is a typical pattern for what you'd see around here. Um, this is called succession and it basically is just the change of a given ecosystem over time. 
And how you manage an ecosystem and for what species um, depends on where you want to see this succession stop. Um, but if you if we're just to let you know a forest go, um, and there were no other inputs, um, you weren't having to worry about invasive plants or things like that, and no other uh, impacts from humans or development. Say like you know 200 300 years ago, this is the natural progression that uh, a terrestrial forest in this area would take. And if you take this back further to the left, you know, before you see annual plants, you could even take this back all the way to like a pond, you know, where a pond slowly silts in, dries out, becomes a meadow, and then a meadow slowly transitions into a forest. And this pattern, uh, you know, can be seen throughout throughout the United States. So when you're looking at succession, that is the, you know, the transition from one habitat type to another, um, it's often uh, you know, brought on by things like disturbance, okay? And, um, <clears throat> you know, disturbance is basically a, a dramatic event that fundamentally changes uh, the ecosystem either through uh, physical actions, um, like, you know, fire uh, or like flood, or it could also be things like, you know, disease or things like that that come through and, and fundamentally change things by either wiping out a, a couple different um, species or changing the structure of the community. As a whole or the ecosystem as a whole. So when we're looking at succession um, post disturbance, that's often when you'll see what are called early successional forests. Um, and in many cases, fire is the way we achieve that or naturally how that would have occurred where a forest would burn um, and you'd then have an early successional forest pop up. Um, grasslands are another example and grasslands are probably what's more common around here when you see uh, Forest burned down if it totally burns, or if the area floods and then you know, with a pond or something, and then that water is no longer there, you'll have a grassland pop up. Um, in many cases, too, um, this disturbance is anthropogenic. So, uh, farming, for example, would be a great example of a disturbance that we see around here. Um, so, you farm for many years and you just let, let the farm go, or the, or the area is no longer farmed, and you basically get a grassland that slowly uh, turns into a forest. And there are certain species like this grasshopper sparrow that utilize these early successional types of habitats, you know, before it's fully grown into a forest uh, to survive. And they, these guys need 60, around 60 acres of contiguous uh, meadow habitat, grassland habitat uh, to breed. So uh, it's hard to manage for that here in Fairfax County in urbanized areas. Here's an example of how we're trying to do that though. This is something that Fairfax County does through our prescribed burn program. So we keep these uh, ecosystems in an early successional state by reintroducing disturbance uh, into the systems to keep them in this grassland habit, this grassland meadow uh, type habitat. Okay, so let's talk about conservation and management of wildlife. We've kind of touched on some of this stuff, but you know, talking about habitats in Virginia um, and how we manage wildlife within them, there are so many different habitats you can manage for here. We're not possibly going to be able to get into all of this, um, so I don't necessarily expect everyone to know all the best management strategies for a particular type of habitat. But often, you have to take these habitats into consideration um, when you're looking at which species uh, you're managing. And um, specifically, you need to make sure that those species have the habitat they need or, or you're aiming for the right type of habitat to uh, get that wildlife uh, where it needs to be. So in many cases, um, that, that could be more than one type of habitat. So migratory birds, for example, need multiple types depending on where you're managing that population. Um, so, you know, talking about forests as, as a starting point, most people, when they think about managing habitat for wildlife, they think about forests. Um, and uh, many cases, you know, disturbance can also be used um, either through the form of fire, and in some cases, manual or, um, or chemical removal of invasive plants to set the stage for a population of, of organisms to have uh, success there. Um, sometimes that means selecting and cutting out certain types of trees uh, to favor certain organisms. Uh, and oftentimes you're targeting that work towards a specific species. Many t in many cases, a, a, a non-generalist species that uh, is going to have a hard time surviving unless, uh, you know, managers step in to make that situation ideal for them. Uh, wetlands, you know, are, are similar in the sense that uh, oftentimes disturbance is introduced uh, to kind of reset the clock on, on what you have there and, and provide opportunities for uh, some of the less potentially successful species of plants to survive or, or make their way through. So um, that's basically a, you know, a bungled way of saying we go in and remove invasive species if possible. In, in Fairfax County, 
that is definitely uh, something we look out for. And if you ever go to like the eastern shore of Maryland or even up in the Midwest, you'll see this species here on the left, which is Phrag Phragmites or, or common reed. Um, this is an invasive species that's pretty much formed monocultures uh, throughout different wetland habitats, and it makes those habitats, uh, you know, not a lot of organisms can't can't survive or utilize that habitat successfully. So you'll see declines as a result of that. Uh, similar in Fairfax County, cattails will form monocultures uh, in impoundments and ponds and wetlands. And while there are some native species of cattails, generally speaking, you want diversity of plants so you have a diversity of organisms that utilize them to survive. And if you just have one monoculture of uh, cattails fairly limited to the types of organisms they can utilize. Um, I have here wetlands are defined by hydric soils. Hydric soils are um, basically soils that are saturated long enough through like flooding or ponding, you know, um, during the growing season that they develop like anaerobic conditions in the like you know, upper layer of I mean like no oxygen basically. So if you ever like walk in a marsh and you smell that like really methane kind of stinky smell, those are hydric soils. <clears throat> Um, so another type of habitat we manage for are early successional, and we've talked about this a little bit. These are the meadow habitats, you know, for like our grasshopper sparrow, for example. Um, oftentimes we're looking for birds, uh, targeting birds when we're maintaining early successional tips. But again, introducing disturbance is really important. Um, you want to make sure that that meadow doesn't turn into a forest, and it's going to continue to move towards a forest type of habitat unless um, fire or mowing or manual or chemical application of herbicides. Uh, can be utilized to keep it within a certain uh, threshold. Uh, oftentimes you want to connect it with other useful habitat or other types of habitat. So having this soft edge here uh, between a forest and field is important, uh, not only for the brood habitat as stated here, but also because a number of organisms thrive and survive in that edge habitat. <clears throat> so, you know, that's managing the community or the ecosystems for, for wildlife. When we're talking about you know, wild ma management of the wildlife itself, that is, you know, population management. Um, we really have to understand, you know, population numbers, that is. We really have to understand a lot about uh, what that population is doing. The population dynamics that we talked about earlier uh, all play into this. Um, but oftentimes, you know, if you've got a, um, an organism that has succeeded in its carrying capacity and needs, needs to be managed, you'll see benefits to um, other factors within the ecosystem like vegetation. Uh, Animals and then sometimes humans, uh, but it's always important that we we base those decision make that decision making off of science. So, for example, um, if we're going to manage populations of white-tailed deer in Fairfax County um, because of uh, overpopulation and impacts to natural uh, native plants that they're overconsuming, or um, to reduce uh, human-deer interactions via uh, vehicle collisions, it's really important that we know. That we're managing that population appropriately and fully understanding the population size. Um, so we use that by by studying population dynamics and through tools like um, mark capture recapture, which is you know we mark the animals in a given way and then retrap them. And based on how many animals were marked, we can make assumptions about the population. We can do assessments about deer browse and how heavily browse given parks are within the county. To figure out how quickly they're utilizing resources and if there's enough going. Um, you know, remote cameras, and this is just one example, but those are all tools or, you know, variations of tools that are used to assess uh, a given population. <clears throat> so when we're talking about populations of wildlife in Fairfax, um, we typically describe these in three ways, uh, those specific organisms. And I'm not going to make it name these, but we break them down into game organisms, non-game organisms, and threatened and endangered uh, species. And they're all managed slightly differently depending on which one of these you're talking about. There may be some similarities, but um, if you're managing a, a game species, which are those that are actively hunted or, or trapped, um, you might manage those in a way that um, presents uh, an opportunity for uh, hunters or trappers to be able to capture enough. And you may factor in how much a given uh, harvest is for a year into your population uh, dynamics and, and metrics. Non-game species typically are not harvested, so we don't worry about that. Um, and then, or they shouldn't be harvested, that's to say they may be. There is harvest going on, that needs to be factored into the population uh, assessment as well. And then threatened or endangered species, and you know, those, uh, we, we take a, take a, you need to take a special look at those and ensure that the habitat's there, and also um, if there's any pressing threats to those organisms, you know, you, those need to be factored into, you know, how you approach management of the species itself. <clears throat> 
So just examples, game organisms, deer, elk, turkey, non-game organisms are like prothonotary warbler, box turtles, or spotted salamanders. Um, and then threatened and, or uh, endangered species in Virginia would be like wood turtles, the Indiana bat, Shenandoah salamander, Stigobromus amphipod, just to name a few. You can find these lists online as well. I'm curious to, to hear about more of them. So, you know, when it comes to enforcement or management uh, of these organisms, uh, we look to the feds and the state to kind of lead the way as far as legislation and permitting is concerned. Um, so, you know, they kind of set the laws, uh, especially you know, talk about the federal level. Um, you know, they're managing um, they're managing wildlife uh, very broadly, and they provide directives to the states who uh, then establish ground rules within the state based on their knowledge of the local uh, organisms and the population dynamics that they're finding. And they can then uh, provide some directives uh, to federal agents like my, I'm sorry, uh, local agents like myself um, who manage a smaller area, in this case, Fairfax County Park Authority. Our activities are also um, permitted through these organizations, typically state organiz organizations. But if we're working with, uh, you know, endangered species or, um, you know, migratory birds or things like that, then you need to involve federal permitting as well. So there's a lot of a lot of permitting and red tape when it comes to, to working with wildlife. Uh, and that's that's because they, these organizations don't just want anyone going out there, you know, manipul manipulating these populations. You need to have specialists uh, who study the stuff and have a firm understanding uh, of you know, what makes those population ticks, what makes those populations tick and how to successfully modify them to meet management goals. We talked a lot about this stuff here. Um, let's see, we're going to keep going for the sake of time. Um, so one thing we talked about is uh, limiting factors, and we did touch on cultural caring capacity a little bit um, with that picture of the deer in the car, and that would certainly be one of those anthropogenic limiting factors, you know, human limiting factors that um, can reduce the population of a, a given organism. Um, but, uh, you know, if we look at the country as a whole, you can see that, you know, some organisms, um, maximum of species that the human population can tolerate is limited through other factors. Uh, for example, with grizzly bears, it could be over competition for salmon or, in many cases, encroachment from, encroachment into their habitat from development. <clears throat> uh, and then as we discussed with deer, you know, culturally, they are, uh, you know, we, we hit a lot of them with our cars and, um, you know, they're from a from a biological perspective. There, there's far too many of them here uh, than to meet their minimum genetic needs. Um, and at some point, uh, you know, they will they will continue to um, expand their population or increase their population because there aren't limiting factors here in this part of Virginia like there once were, like um, uh, well, bears, wolves, and other predators. Uh, even hunting has declined, so uh, that population needs to be. Reduced through um, capacity driven by state. Uh, can you say that again, or can someone read that chat? I only get to see it for a second, and then it, it disappears real quick. Is cultural capacity governed by state? Is that what I read? Yes. The question is: Is cultural carrying capacity determined by state? Who determines them? Okay, um, that's a good question, and I, there's not a not a good answer for it. Um, so. If it's an actively managed population, um, like an overabundant species like white-tailed deer, where the habitat supports more than people can deal with essentially on a day-to-day -day basis, then yeah, we would look the state, um, at the state or the locality, depending on you know who has permission or who's managing the land. Yeah, would step in and, and set the the population goals for that organism. So, for example, with white-tailed deer. Um, in Fairfax County, that's managed actually by uh, by the police department. Believe it or not, they have a whole wildlife arm that manage white-tailed deer population, and they have set population goals that they're trying to achieve that are within, um, you know, uh, that would maintain a healthy white-tailed deer population, but reduce the like social, cultural, sorry, carrying capacity of white-tailed deer to reduce deer car collisions or um, over herbivory of uh, native plants or or gardens in some. In some cases, like I said, you know, um, the reduction of predators locally is why we're seeing these increase increases in that particular species. That's a great question. Yeah, and usually, if it's a if it's a overabundant species, um, 
then yeah, there'd be some regulatory agency that would set their goal population for that. Uh, just another example, like mosquitoes, for example, um, they may not have a defined cultural carrying capacity, but we know that there's very little tolerance for the types of mosquitoes that might breed uh, Zika virus um, or uh, West Nile virus, uh, out, like uh, Aedes albopictus. Those are that's the species I think, uh, or Aedes aegypti. Um, so those species have a much lower cultural carrying capacity than say white-tailed deer. Well, we want none of them basically. They're an invasive species as well. So um, that cultural capacity is set by the health department here in Fairfax County, and we are looking for as few of those as possible. Great question. Um, so sometimes these, uh, you know, these populations can be managed by hunting. I'm going to keep going quick here because I'm running out of time. I want to make sure everyone has uh, time for questions and for Sam to talk. Um, so you know, hunting is one means of controlling the population, um, and that's set through bag limits. So bag limits are essentially how many of a given organism uh, a given hunter can take it within a given uh, time period. And those numbers are established by studying population dynamics and actively studying the population that's being controlled. Now, this is a sea turtle, and that's not a great example of a population that is actively hunted for uh, population control, but they're utilizing a pit tag uh, to track this organism. Um, that's part of the mark capture recapture study. And these are the same pit tags you might find in your dog or cat when the vet pit tags them. So. Kind of cool stuff. We use those in wildlife management all the time. So as far as like, you know, how we engage with wildlife and threats to, uh, you know, populations and biodiversity in general, um, they're all the things you're probably thinking about. You live in Fairfax, so you see this stuff every day. Uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the urban wildland interface, uh, you know, we are at constant conflict with the organisms. Uh, or they are at constant conflict with us, the organisms that call that area home. We see things like deer, beavers, they're constantly abutting human development. There's some other things that may not be as obvious though. Um, so habitat destruction is obviously a development issue, but invasive species, plants, animals, um, we'll talk more about that. Pollution, I mean, uh, overpopulation, over harvesting. I feel like a lot of the stuff, it, you can see it every day here in Fairfax. Um, over harvesting may be the, uh, the exception to that because we don't have a lot of hunting here as part of the state. So changes to habitat, um, this is what we see most of here, the, you know, the rapid development in Fairfax County. That can be complete destruction. It can be degradation where the habitat's just not as good as it needs to be for specialists like this grasshopper sparrow to survive, or fragmentation. And this is really why I put this picture in here because like I said, grasshopper sparrows need 60 contiguous acres of meadow habitat to effectively breed. And if that area is split up into homes and subdivisions, you don't have that contiguous acreage, then you're not gonna have these, these guys coming here. So here's an example, Fairfax County, 1960, 17, big difference there. You can see the fragmentation, destruction, and taking of, of habitat. Um, same thing, here's another part of the county. Boom, look at all those subdivisions. So this is what we're, this is what we're working with in the county and what we're striving to uh, make sure that the populations that we have here are able to survive and thrive. Uh, sometimes that involves active management. And sometimes it involves making sure that um, you know, where development happens in the state or in the county, it happens responsibly so that it doesn't impact uh, you know, these populations. Uh, invasive species um, are, are a huge issue in Fairfax County. And those are introduced plants or animals uh, that are often able to you know, outcompete our native organisms like the deer, primarily because they uh, don't have a, a predator or you know, something that's eat, you know, like in the case of English ivy, there's no animal really that eats too much of them, except for the one thing is birds leave the berries and then poop the berries out and replant them. So the other characteristic they often have is a rapid reproduction or very successful reproduction, and the birds do that here for, um, you know, they, they cause a number of issues. And if you go out in the woods around here, you can see that these monocultures just don't provide a good habitat for the, the, a lot of the organisms need to survive. Um, they can reduce available food or, or compete with available, for available resources with um, our, our native organisms. So uh, in some cases, uh, we are unable to remove these organisms completely, so we have to control them and manage, uh, manage them where appropriate. And oftentimes that means identifying key or important habitats for wildlife and targeting our management activities to those areas. Uh, we're not gonna be able to go in every garden and lawn in Fairfax County and, and remove English ivy or, or other invasive plants like that. Diseases, uh, same sort of thing, although not as obvious in this part of the county, they are here. Um, of particular note, white-nosed bat syndrome has been 
uh, terrible to the, the bats of Virginia, uh, you know, wiping out huge populations of them. I mean, chronic wasting disease is uh, something that we're dealing with now, although it's not in Fairfax yet. Um, and then chytrid is an, uh, a fungus and amphibian. So all these sorts of things, you know, these are just three examples, but there are tons of these things that can, you know, uh, impact um, populations. And in many cases, anthrop anthropogenic uh, impacts to populations or, or development or reduction of habitat can exacerbate some of these as well. And so um, chronic wasting disease is one of the examples I just gave. And this is uh, an infectious, like a uh, neurological disease found in deer. Uh, white-tailed deer around here, but it's also an elk. Uh, uh, and it's caused by um, like abnormal infections and in proteins called prions, uh, and that they can be actually passed through bodily fluids from one deer to the other, um, and possibly indirectly through soil and water. It's like sort of in the same family of diseases like mad cow disease, if you've heard of that one. And it is 100% fatal to affected animals. Uh, we don't have a treatment or vaccine. Um, so, you know, when we're managing white-tailed deer populations, it's also important to be aware of other impacts to that population that may be limiting uh, the population either now or in the future. So here you can see, you know, this is a fairly dated map um, of, of hotspots for chronic wasting disease or uh, positive individuals that were detected in parts of Virginia, West Virginia. Uh, it's, it's since expanded uh, further into Virginia itself. However, we don't have any cases in Fairfax at this time. <clears throat> and then, you know, when we're talking about impacts to wildlife, it's always important to talk about how, um, you know, we classify them uh, based on, you know, how at risk they are for being either uh, extinct or extirpated. Um, so under the Endangered Species Act, which is a you know, federal legislation, basically we, we classify them as endangered threatened uh, candidate species. Um, so, uh, you know, endangered means, you know, at risk, threatened is a little bit less so. Candid species is like, hey, we're watching you, like, you know, your habitat or your <laughs> available resources are running low, so you might be making it on the list soon. It's kind of how they rank uh, organisms um, based on a like, pressing need to protect them. Um, and they also establish other definitions you'll see here. So, in addition to categorizing organisms, they'll have, they'll categorize habitat. So. The organism might not be endangered, but the habitat that they rely on may be uh, crucially declining and they need to fo make a focus on re restoring that habitat. Um, like we talked about, managing wildlife often involves managing their, their habitat. And then uh, important for each of these organisms, um, a recovery plan has to be in place and it specifically has to include activities that can be undertaken to recover the species. It can't just be like, oh, we really need to do something about this. And when you uh, classify an organism into one of these categories, you need to have specific activities that can be undertaken to help restore it. Um, some other uh, uh, species, Endangered Species Act terms you might see thrown around, you're probably familiar with these, extinct, it's no longer existence, extirpated, no longer existence in a specific area, so we might not have it in the state anymore, it might be extirpated from the state, uh, or endangered is in, endangered of extinction. Um, so, we talked about threatened, likely to become endangered through all or most of its range. Um, a couple of these other, oops, a couple of these other categories I want to take a note on. Um, candidate species are basically uh, organisms that have been studied by the, the you know, the federal government uh, and, and are basically going to be considered for a proposal to be put on the list. Um, there just might be a higher priority species and they haven't quite, you know, hit the threshold yet. There might be, it might be competing uh, with another organism that, uh, for priority uh, of listing. So they're basically on deck or on hold to get listed. And then in many cases, uh, you'll, you'll see the word reintrodu reintroduction thrown around as far as an activity that can be utilized to help restore species. And that's just as the name and sound is uh, supplementing wild populations, um, basically trying to in increase the genetic diversity and overall population within a given area in the hopes that you'll be able to form a breeding population and it'll be able to expand. Um, so when you're talking about you know, species that are identified by the Endangered Species Act or have been, um, you know, have made it to this list essentially, you'll see there's a lot of common elements to them. Um, and you'll see specialists on here, food specialists, endemic specialists, habitat specialists. Again, these specialists are the ones that are really most at risk because, um, frankly, they are unable to adapt to, you know, a changing habitat. And, these anthrop anthropogenic impacts can go beyond 
uh, you know, physical development of an area like we see in Fairfax County, but can even be things like climate change and that organism's inability to adapt to changes in the climate. Um, so oftentimes those organisms that have a very special little um, you know, niche or, or food source that they occupy, if that's not available to them, they don't survive very long. Um, this is an example of one here that I've worked with. Uh, this is the Eastern Hellbender. And uh, you know, they're found in very cold, very clean streams with a certain size substrate. You know, they only like certain types of rocks and they feed primarily on crayfish, right? So you've got a lot of very specific things there that this organism needs to survive. And if it doesn't have one of those elements to its habitat or its ecosystem, then it's not gonna make it. Uh, so you'll see commonalities of organisms that are, that are listed, uh, typically specialists. That's, that's uh, mostly what you're gonna see on there. You're not gonna see uh, cardinals, for example, or white-tailed deer that are able to adapt to uh, an urbanizing environment, which is not typically the case. Some other things, they're particularly large, slow, um, or if they're of high value, certainly, you know, if, if they've been overhunted, you, know, you have to watch out for those too. So, um, so thanks for sitting with me through this presentation. I know I threw a lot at you, and these were some busy slides, with a lot of text on them, um, but I hope it gives you a good primer uh, into wildlife, and it's a really fascinating, awesome field. Um, so if anyone you know has an interest in pursuing it, you know, I always highly recommend it, especially if you're passionate about it. Happy to answer any questions about this or general stuff in Fairfax or general wildlife questions I didn't talk about, you know, fire away. I don't know everything, but I know a little bit about a lot of stuff. So if I don't know the answer, uh, I will respond. And I'll get it back to you in an email. Thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. I think you covered a lot of the things that we wanted to know about wildlife. I do know we had a couple of questions. Sure. Um, there was one from Sabila in the chat. Um, and if Sabila wants to ask that one, they can. And I know Kritika has a question as well. So okay. if either of them would like to ask, they can. If not, I'll go ahead and read it. Alrighty, so the first one is about our deer overpopulation. Mm -hmm. Are we trying to find a solution to chronic wasting disease? Isn't it helping limit deer overpopulation? Um, so yeah, we are, so at the, at the county level, um, so Fairfax County, we don't have a program, you know, looking for a cure for chronic wasting disease, but, you know, generally as a country, yeah, I, I think the state, uh, has a program where they're, they're trying to find a solution. Certainly the federal government's working on it. Um, and the second part, is it, is it good? Um, so, you know, cause it controls population. So I think the problem with a lot of these diseases uh, or viruses is, you know, we don't know if we can't control it, then it, it may you know, swing, uh, may swing the opposite direction. You know, this is a, a new virus that's impact or a new disease rather that's impacting these, these deer. And if we don't have a, a control for it, then it's not really a control. It can rapidly, uh, you know, it could potentially rapidly wipe out the population. So uh, an example of a, of a novel organism coming to Fairfax County and doing just that is the emerald ash borer. Um, so not that ash trees were overpopulated, but just as an example, you know, this is a small um, beetle from Asia that, that was introduced here and uh, didn't have any natural predators or very few natural predators was able to, to utilize a local food source that our ash trees um, was very successful at that and basically wiped them out in this area. So um, same with uh, chestnut blight uh, for these uh, examples in history for these uh, novel organisms or viruses, diseases, what have you came in here, and wiped something out completely. And if you looked at the, you know, the canopy of Fairfax County, 300 years ago, you'd see a lot more chestnut trees, uh, ash trees, and hemlocks because of that. It's, it's changed a lot. And the population, or the uh, makeup of the trees we have here are a very, a very good example of what happens if one of these novel organisms comes in, we don't have a control for it. But that's a, that's a good question. Thank you. And our second question is, have monarch butterfly populations in Fairfax County improved due to the Monarch Garden Initiative started a while ago? And that is when they migrate over Fairfax in the fall. 
you know, I don't know. I don't know if they've improved. Um, if there's been a mark recapture study on them, typically, I think with insects and stuff, you know, it's, uh, monarchs they, you know, they can um, mark them subtly and and track their numbers uh, across their uh, migration. But um, I don't know the answer to that question. However, I do know that some of the habitats that are being um, created or modified or improved to support. Um, Monarchs are also doing so for other native pollinators. Uh, so, you know, they are generally benefiting a, a lot of our insect populations, but I can't say for sure if the population of monarchs has improved in Fairfax County specifically. And I don't know if anyone is studying it at the local level. They're probably looking uh, regionally, but um, that's a great question. I can certainly find out. 